Uh, right, graphene. Uh, so, first, graphene can often be sort of misinterpreted as a resources company or a mining company, which we are neither. We are a materials technology company, or probably more accurately described as a value add manufacturer. In Australia, around the world, there are a lot of people digging stuff out of the ground and then sort of passing where the true value comes in a product onto somebody else. That is us. We start with a mined graphite, either a high purity vein graphite or a flake graphite that has been purified. And we, we get that as feedstock for somewhere between $1,000 to $2,000 a tonne. It's feedstock. And then what we do is we use a, a patented process called electrochemical exfoliation. So we basically dissolve uh, graphite and we turn it into a product called graphene, or more, more uh, precise graphene nanoplatelets. So think of a, a platelet the shape of your cell phone, very thin, somewhere between one and 10 atoms, and then a, a diameter of somewhere between five and 70 micron. To the naked eye, it looks like a gray powder. And we sell that product for somewhere between $50,000 a tonne, all the way up to about $1.2 million a tonne. So the value add there is significant. We're talking about a product that is new. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, is not, it is not commoditized in any sense as it stands today. That will happen eventually over time. But as it stands today, uh, it's a pretty privileged place to be in. Graphene still retails for anywhere between, let's say, $100 or $50 per kilo, all the way up to $50,000 a kilo, even higher in some cases. Uh, we have... Uh, constructed our business around making graphene far more affordable and in abundance. So graphene is an additive product. You add it into materials to enhance certain properties of those materials. So graphene by itself is about 200 times stronger than steel. It's also electrically conductive, thermally conductive. It has anti-corrosion properties. It is a fire retardant. And at the same time, it's also transparent and flexible. So please keep in mind it's still a powder. One of the probably misconceptions people have is that it's a sheet of stuff that you can sort of move around. It's a powder that you put in as an additive. Now, graphene is a new material. There has, uh, the, the adoption of new materials over time is a well-proven process. Now, some of you will know about graphene and you'll know that it's about two decades old and we've had huge hype in those, in those two years of all the exciting things you can do with it. It's spent t uh, 20 years in academia and companies creating ideas about how to use it. So part of the process of adopting new materials is what we call technology validation. How do you find out where to use the material? How do you make it? Who's going to use it? Is it commercially viable? That is a two-decade process for graphene, at least. It then goes into early commercializations, where you start and talk to clients and trying to get it into products. And then mass adoption, where everybody knows what it is and knows how to use it. Now, that process is, like I said, well proven. That sort of process for the plastics, when it was first discovered, into adoption, was nearly 40 years long. In carbon fibre, it was about 25 years. And then in the use of silicon and a microchip, it was somewhere between 15 and 25 years, depending how you cut it. All of these materials have been revolutionary in materials markets, and they've all taken considerable time. The great thing about knowing that is that we can plot where graphene is on its evolution. Now, first graphene, we like to consider ourselves as bridging the gap between technology validation and early commercialization. There is many graphene companies around the world that over the last two decades have spent spending into academia to tell them how to use graphene. They've created ideas. They've gone very deep into technology, for instance, into just an anti-corrosion coating, or just into the use in footwear or textiles. First Graphene has done it slightly different. When we started getting into understanding our process and how to make graphene, we looked at scale. We can see that in time, demand for graph graphene is gonna be astronomical. It will be part of everything we touch. <clears throat> now, 
as people have developed and gone deep into the tech, we've developed that scale, and we've also focused on making it cheaper, making more of it, making it more scalable or customizable to your application. At the same time, instead of investing tens of millions of dollars into our own research and development, we have partnered with commercial clients. So instead of us going to uh, the cement or concrete industry and developing all of that technology ourselves and understanding cement mixtures, we've gone to the experts and said, how can we help? What we look for in a client is somebody that says, I've got a problem that I think graphene can solve, let's talk. And that's how we help them. Our IP is based around manufacturing graphene, what graphene you use for what application and results, and how you disperse that in your product. Getting a grey powder through a product such as polymers is actually quite complex. <clears throat> uh, as I said before, we like to think we have bridged that gap. Through the process of us developing our scale uh, manufacturing facility, we have partnered with significant clients, such as uh, the UK's largest cement producer. Those are one of our early stage clients. Uh, Western Australian largest composite pool manufacturer. These clients are all have problems to solve that we've partnered with. So now as we reach the stage of early commercialization, we've already got two to three years of client relations built and generating revenue. We're one of the very few graphene companies in the world that is actually generating revenue today. <clears throat> Uh, within the last sort of six to 12 months, we have seen the uptake of commercial interest. When you develop a new application with graphene, it could have been two years to get to a point of actually getting an order. Now that shrinks to six months. It's a lot faster now. and That uptake is becoming much more prevalent each week we get a new client on. It's an exciting time. <clears throat> so we now like to consider that the adoption curve for graphene is now in that early commercialization period. Our facility in Western Australia, in Henderson, we've uh, set it up with the capacity of about 100 tonne. Now, 100 tonne in the world of graphene is a lot. Uh, when you add it into polymers or concretes, you're talking about a very, very low addition rate, a quarter of a percent. In some cases in cement, it's 0.07% to cement weight. So very small amounts go a long way. So 100 tonne is a great deal. Cost, we've cons consistently stepped down and optimised our process to get cheaper and cheaper, which opens up more industries to us. One of the biggest um, cautions that we have is because graphene touches on so many different applications, concrete, polymers, composites, coatings, etc., uh, there's always the risk of getting blindsided or too interested in one. I'm a self-confessed car nut, so when we have Formula One teams asking to develop products with us, they'll only use 50 or 100 grams a year. It's not worth our time, but we fight that interest out of, out of sort of personal interest. We focus on the large-scale ones, the cement, the concrete, polymers, composites, very, very large opportunities. In terms of quality and consistency, ours is a continuous flow process. So it's the same product that comes out every week. It is standardised across seven different products, which is particle size. <clears throat> We've also pushed through regulatory approval, so our product is now approved for use in Europe, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and also partway through the EPA approval in the US. So it's something that's very tick pretty much ticked off. We approach the early commercialisation stage without the worry of CapEx to create scale. We've got it. We just focus on the commercials now. Across our, as I said before, we've got a very, very wide opportunity of, of, of application. So we like to trim it down to sort of four, um, four verticals here. Um, what I'll do is I'll just give you a, a snapshot of our current clients and what they use it for. So in cement and concrete, you can put tiny amounts of graphene and make it 20% stronger. Or you can improve its resistance to chloride and sulphate erosion, or you can reduce the CO2 footprint. Our UK client, uh, the Breeden Group, we have an exclusive agreement with them to develop and commercialise graphene-enhanced cement. Breeden is the largest producer of cement in the UK. They make some 4 million tonnes of cement every year. Their process is about trying to reduce the CO2 emissions, which they pay for in the UK, to make their product um, perform the same as a higher 
clinker or ordinary Portland cement content. So that, when you reduce the amount of clink you use or the active ingredient in cement, the, the uh, grinding efficiencies, and the resultant strength and increase, you've got a product there that caters for that bulk of the market, but without the CO2 footprint to go with it. That opportunity for us is a 70,000 tonne opportunity in the UK, one client. <clears throat> that could correlate to half a billion dollars in revenue for us. So that's why we sort of look at that cement side. The volume is astronomical. On the energy storage stuff, we don't go deep in the tech and try and design battery anodes. We work with battery providers supercapacitor manufacturers, and also perovskite solar cell manufacturers, Halo Cell here in uh, New South Wales, oh, sorry, up in New South Wales. Uh, we work with them to optimise our materials. We customise our materials to their requirements. Composites and plastics is probably what I consider our most exciting segment. This covers swimming pools. Our lead client and largest client today makes composite in-ground swimming pools. They use graphene to make them stronger. They therefore use less GRP or, or glass reinforced plastic, makes it lighter, easier to move, and the barrier properties of graphene means that uh, ground water won't blister through the, the composite. So there's a number of drivers there. They subsequently offer a 25 year warranty on all new products. The polymer segment is exciting because of the, uh, the potential uses of it. At the moment, the people that use most of our graphene is around solar thermal roof tiles. So this is a UK application where they use plastic extruded roof tiles on the, on the roof of your home that you pump water through, the sun heats that, and you get a thermal transfer through the graphene. We see it being used a lot in battery casings, housings. <clears throat> Lastly, there's the case in foam, so coatings, adhesives, that side of uh, products. We have a lot of uh, people using our material in footwear now, so we've had, we're on to our third and fourth clients using it in the soles of footwear, so it extends the life of the sole of your shoe. We also have it being used in cycle wear, so a Brazilian company using it in textiles to dissipate heat faster while you're cycling, uh, and a lot of noise and vibration dampening phones, especially in the construction industry where the fire retardant nature of graphene helps fire regulations for building cladding, that's foam and polymers. So what we're sort of working on over the next <coughs> uh, sort of three to six months, cement and concrete makes up a big uh, focus of ours with that client in, in the UK, huge opportunity. And because it's a product that is now developed, we're just trying to move that around every cement manufacturer globally. So we've got four or five trials that are going through that same process as we, as we have in the UK. Composites and polymers, we're seeing follow-on people. The first movers in, in GRP, um, chop strand mat type uh, composite applications, we're now like six, seven, and eight clients doing that same thing. And that's a real comfort to us because it proves that our first first mover wasn't just a fluke, we can do it again and again and again and the adoption is becoming more accepted. Coatings and elastomers, this is actually focused more on the Australian mining -ish industry. Um, things like polyurethanes, thermoplastics, uh, both cast and spray on, uh, benefit greatly in the mining space just due to abrasion resistance and fire retardancy. Underground mining when you've got a lot of sprayed on polyureth polyurethanes, making that fire retardant is really important. Uh, bucket wheel reclaimers, the big diggers that you see in mine sites, <coughs> the wear liners on those, graphene can extend the life of those by about seven times. So it's a significant advantage. And then lastly, energy generation. We're working through some, uh, some projects with Halo Cell. So they produce a perovskite solar cell, which is produced reel to reel, not a single unit at a time. Uh, now, our graphene removes the need for a silver or gold layer in a perovskite cell, meaning their bomb cost is about 80% cheaper and their efficiency goes up. So it's one of those killer applications where nothing compares or does that same work function as graphene. We've also expanded in through our distributor network, which is really important to us. Being a small company, we don't want to carry a massive sales team, and we also don't want to spend so much time screening inquiries. We get 100, 150 inquiries through every week, and screening those and weeding out 
the uh, tire kickers or people just wanting to give it a try versus somebody that actually has a problem that can be solved. So we rely on those distributors. We've also got to a point now where we have enough use case, enough knowledge about applications and which product to use that we can navigate that fairly quickly. Pipeline, as I said, we get a lot. We do screen them down quite quickly. We have about 30 clients, reoccurring clients, buying our product today, and a good pipeline in regulatory approvals, production trials, marketing releases. So that really fills or, or sort of supports our position of graphene being in that early adoption phase, so commercialization phase. Just in terms of financials, um, as you can see, the bottom graph, uh, that is our cash burn. We, we've managed to reduce our cash burn as we've moved away from academic spend and focused on clients that are doing their own R&D. We've managed to get our cash burn right back to sort of 2.8, 2.7 million. And that trajectory, I think, will follow suit over the next year or so through to that break-even point. The top graph, that's our sort of revenue. So we have block revenue, so our graphene reoccurring revenue is the dark green and then we have development projects, followed by grant programs as well. So just to wrap up, um, the broader adoption of, of graphene is now inevitable. It's just a case of how long it takes to that for, our, um, for our clients to roll out these, these technologies. Uh, it is a new materials platform, but it's following that really predictable curve, that adoption curve, and we can clearly see where we're sitting at the moment. We've bridged that gap and without a doubt sit in a position of advantage because of our approach to these things. We have our clients, we have our clients that are already two years deep in their, in their development and ready to roll that out. We're entering that commercial growth phase now, which gives us a pretty bright future over the next one to two years. And we believe that we're leading that, that adoption. Thank you.